And I call on Donald Cameron to move and speak to the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to open this afternoon's debate on staffing in Scotland's health and social care services. I would like to begin with a tribute to the incredible work that dedicated staff within our NHS and social care sector carry out on a daily basis. It can be difficult work with long hours, often in challenging circumstances. The efforts of staff frequently go unnoticed, and yet professionals in the NHS and care sectors are still among some of the most dedicated public servants of all. They need our support so they can get on with doing what they do best, caring for patients, treating illness, and saving lives. But that work is under threat. It has become clear that the NHS workforce is overstretched and struggling to meet ever-increasing demands on frontline services. In the last few months, I have met with patients, medical staff, pressure groups, professional associations and individuals, and their message is clear. Across the board, staffing levels in the NHS are in crisis. It's a deep, systemic problem which cuts across the whole workforce. It's not just happening in one branch of the medical profession. It's in many. It's not just in the NHS, but in the social care workforce too. It's not just in rural Scotland. It's happening right here in Edinburgh and other urban centres. And we know that this problem will get much worse. We have an ageing workforce, many of whom will shortly retire. We see bodies like the Royal College of Midwives saying that there is a, quote, retirement time bomb in nursing and midwifery with one in five due to retire over the next decade. It's worse in general practice. The Scottish Government's own figures say that one in three GPs will retire in the next 10 years. That brings further pressure on those who are left to battle the increasing demand. In many senses, it's a vicious circle. Don't listen to me on this. Listen to the professionals. Listen to the BMA who say, and I quote, that vacant posts place immense pressure on the service. When NHS boards cannot fill a post, other doctors within the team have to cover the workload or the service may be reduced. Staff are asked to work increasingly long hours and more intensely to fill the gaps. In the last session, I am aware that efforts were made in this Parliament on a cross-party basis to try and avert this crisis in a collaborative manner, but that the SNP government sat on its hands. So in many ways, this debate is a lament for that lost opportunity. We are now reaping the whirlwind because the crisis is upon us. And I have no hesitation in condemning the sheer lethargy of the Scottish Government, which has brought us to this point. Often in politics, some of the most robust arguments we have are about stark, vigorous policy choices taken by a government for better or for worse. But not here. Despite the repeated warnings, there's no sign of vigour Instead, we have inertia, we have listlessness, we have a government sleepwalking through this crisis. What answers do they bring? There are two, two standard responses. We are told that patient satisfaction is at an all-time high and that NHS staffing is at record levels. And we are presented with a wall of numbers, a barrage of statistics, as if that provides all the answers. Well, let me save them some time this afternoon. Let's look at these claims on patient satisfaction Patients are, of course, the most important people in our health service. Their care is paramount, and it's our job to ensure they have access to world-class health care, free at the point of use and based on need. It's obvious that one benchmark we can measure the NHS with is patient satisfaction. However, what is fundamentally important is that we have sufficient numbers of highly trained staff to surround that patient and provide that care. Patient care and staff well-being are intrinsically linked. And while the Scottish Government may be able to talk about patient satisfaction today, if the NHS remains chronically understaffed and staff numbers and morale plummet, that will vanish overnight. On staffing levels, the Scottish Government, and in particular the First Minister, like to tell us repeatedly that staff numbers sit at record levels, that the NHS has never employed more people. But record numbers of staff does not mean that there are enough staff. Again, don't listen to me, listen to the professionals, listen to the Royal College of Nurses, who say as, as, as follows. The increase in staff is not keeping pace with demand. 
And even more worrying, almost 600 posts have been vacant for three months or more. Listen to the Royal College of Radiologists, whose UK workforce report of last week says this. The mismatch between growth in workforce and demand is even more marked in Scotland, where the consultant workforce grew by 3% between 2010 and 2015, and the number of CT and MRI scans each increased by 55%. Let's not forget the key role radiologists play in several aspects of NHS care, especially in cancer treatment. It's a very simple, very clear picture. Demand is outstripping staff numbers. So merely parroting the line, there are record numbers of NH staff, is no answer to this crisis. There are record numbers of people getting old in Scotland. There are record numbers of demands being placed on the NHS. It is quite simply selling a fantasy that our NHS is coping under SNP stewardship. Rather like the band on the Titanic, the government are trying to reassure us that all is well when patently it is not. Nobody is buying it. Yes, of course. Willie Rennie. With much as, as to what he's been saying this afternoon, he would also recognise with the GPs that it's not just an issue of increasing demand, but a change in nature of the workforce too. And the Royal College of GPs say that there are going to be over 800 GPs short by 2020. I mean, it's got worse than the last year. Do you think the government's doing enough in that regard? Donald Cameron. Clearly no. <laughs> no. No, Mr Rennie. The government are not doing enough, and I'll come on to GPs in a moment. But let's just stick with the Royal College of Nurses, who have said several times, without changes to the way health services are delivered, there's a risk that Scotland could return to the boom and bust years where health boards targeted the nursing workforce for cuts simply to balance their books. And my central charge against this government is one of failing to take responsibility. The government must recognise that this isn't the fault of the previous administration. This isn't the fault of Westminster. That it's no good trying to distract us by pointing to what's happening in England or Wales. <laughs> that after almost a decade in government, with five more years to go, the buck stops with them. And while we're on it, I note the government's amendment today contains that toxic mixture of belligerence and avoidance of responsibility we've grown used to. Brexit is blamed, as if these staffing problems somehow only came into existence on the 24th of June this year. The UK's government approach to the NHS in England is criticised, though notably without mention of the fact that health spending in England increased at a significantly greater rate than in Scotland over the last five years. And whilst on this topic, Whilst on this topic of comparing our position to that of the NHS in England, if I could be permitted to quote from the Bible, first remove the beam out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. I've only been around a short time, but even I know that health policy was devolved completely and without reservation to the Scottish Parliament in 1999, that the SNP have run this health service for almost a decade, and then when it comes to the state of the NHS workforce in 2016, only one party and one government is culpable. And the longer the SNP try to dodge these issues, the worse the problems will get. We are in the depths of the most serious crisis to affect the NHS in years, and it's time for the SNP to take responsibility and belatedly to take action. Let me touch briefly on a few areas which I hope other members will explore across the chamber in more detail during the afternoon, and which time does not permit me to cover. Locum and agency costs. As we revealed last week, the NHS spent almost a quarter of a billion pounds on locum doctors and nurses last year. That's a 41 million pound increase on the previous year, with some health boards even doubling their spend. The cost of that is one thing, but it also reveals the massive staffing problem at the heart of the NHS, especially when this money could go towards employing permanent staff. Again, don't listen to me, listen to the professionals. The Royal College of Nurses say, and I quote, an increase in bank and agency staff is an expensive temporary fix, does not address short staffing shortages, and is not sustainable in the long term. Let me talk about the social care workforce, because it's not just our NHS staff that is under pressure. Our social care workforce is stretched and getting older. A study conducted at the end of last year noted that 62% of 
of social care staff had to carry out additional work most weeks. And worse still, around 90% said they felt they'd seen a reduction in the amount of support available to the people they care for. The Health Committee last week heard from social care workers, as well as leaders in the sector, with the latter saying that around 60,000 extra social care staff will be required in Scotland to meet growing demand as a result of our ageing population. Quite frankly, we are at breaking point. And lastly, on multidisciplinary GP hubs, there is a general consensus that the future of primary care will see the creation of multidisciplinary hubs with a number of health professionals working alongside GPs in the community. We welcome that direction of travel. But to achieve that, we must recognise that more staff will be needed with a broader skill mix. And at the moment, there is a shortage of those other professionals in any event. Now, if there are already workforce issues in terms of advanced nurse practitioners, physiotherapists, dentists, mental health workers, then realising that multidisciplinary vision becomes all the more difficult. Where do we go from here? I am the first to accept that there are societal factors out with everyone's control which makes solving this crisis challenging. I accept that medical advancements are keeping people alive for longer. That is clearly to be welcomed. I accept that it's a challenge to find people to take up posts in some of the most rural communities in Scotland, such as my own region, the Highlands and Islands. I accept that recruiting to some parts of the medical profession is harder in certain disciplines, such as general practice. I accept that to our shame, health inequality still exists in many parts of the country, and this puts additional pressures on our health services. What I don't accept, and what none of us can accept, is that it is enough simply to carry on as we are. Not only must the government take responsibility, but they must begin to tackle this crisis head on. We need clear, focused... Yes, indeed. I think he's probably almost at the end of his speech. At what point are we going to get an apology from the Tory party on all of the things that they've done, all of their policies that have exacerbated health and our quality? Because on this, they're as culpable as the SNP. Thank you, Mr Finlay. Donald Cameron. We need clear, focused workforce planning based on the best data available to plan for the years ahead. I point to one example of what can be done in terms of investment. The Scottish Conservatives have committed to fight for an increase in the amount of money spent on general practice. We would increase the share of the budget which goes to general practice from 8% of the total NHS health board spend in Scotland to 10% by 2020, supported by the Royal College of GPs. So far, we're the only party to call actively for such a pledge. In an interview in April, the First Minister admitted that the share of funding going to general practice had to increase, saying, I'm not disputing the key point here, which is that we've got to increase that percentage. Well, with respect, what are you waiting for? The Scottish Government talk a good game about investing in primary care, yet the facts say something totally different. Only a few days ago, the Royal College of GPs stated that we will have 830 fewer family doctors by 2020 if we don't act now. We are losing almost one GP a week. The government's response, we created more training places. Well, we heard from a GP in the health committee only yesterday who said, not only will they not fill the additional 100 places which have been created, but there are still a number of unfilled places from the previous recruitment round. Everyone in this parliament cares about our NHS, but words are not enough now. The Scottish Government's programme for government was weak on short staffing, weak on supporting primary care, and weak on supporting our hard-working doctors, nurses, social care workers, and other health professionals. Scotland deserves better. And while this staffing crisis requires immediate actions, there is a long-term aspect to this too. We have to create a sustainable NHS that is properly staffed over the next five years, but also over the next 25 years. We have to raise our line of sight beyond the present and look to the future, to the health service that will exist in, say, 2041. How will it be staffed then to cope with many of, you, uh, many of us who will be needing more care? If I could finish by saying, it was once said that a politician thinks of the next election, while the statesman thinks 
of the next generation. In terms of the NHS and its staff, every one of us across this chamber should aspire to the latter. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Cap Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Thank you, President Officer. I'm very happy to take part in this debate and I move the amendment in my name. I think it provides a, another opportunity to acknowledge the extraordinary commitment and dedication of our health and social care staff across Scotland and I pay tribute to them. And it's also an opportunity to ensure that those staff have the right environment to continue providing a world-class service. And I'll come on to that in a moment. But, President Officer, I, I do recollect, and I'm pleased that Jackson Carlaw is sitting next to Donald Cameron. That's very appropriate, because I remember when Jackson Carlaw was health spokesperson for the Conservatives, he often used to make the point in this chamber that no party was in a position to criticise the record of others on the NHS, given, um, almost quoting him here, I think that the Tories are in charge of the NHS in England and Labour are in charge of the NHS in Wales. And therefore, it is a surprise of the tone of the Tory motion today. It talks about having no confidence in this government's workforce plan. And indeed, uh, Donald Cameron has just cited the, the figure of 830 uh, GPs that uh, the RCGP say is required. But just this weekend, the RCGP issued a news release estimating a deficit of 8,371 GPs in England. So surely the same accusation that the Tories are making today in this place of this government on workforce planning must be true of their own government in charge of NHS England. How can it be otherwise? And another example of this double standard, which I'm sure Jackson Carlaw would never have done when he was health spokesperson, was demonstrated at last Thursday's FMQs when Ruth Davidson quoted uh, pockets of meltdown in NHS Scotland, which was interesting because that quote originated from a report which examined 94 hospitals, only three of which were in Scotland. Presiding officer, 87 of those sites are in England under the control of the Conservative government at Westminster. So yes, on these benches, we will point out the double standards of the Tories coming to this place, criticising our record on the NHS, when the record of their own party in government in England is woeful, to say the least. And I could quote many, many organisations that are saying much more uh, powerful words about the record of the Tory party in charge of the NHS in England. We only have to look at the junior doctor strikes that have been uh, um, happening in England compared to the constructive partnership relationship we have with our professions here north of the border. I'll take Jackson Carlos. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary who has sought to paraphrase quotes I don't quite remember making, but what I did do in the last Parliament was work extremely hard over those five years to say that the only way we were going to make success of Scotland's health is if all the parties worked in a bipartisan way, and that that required the Scottish Government to take the initiative to work with the other parties in this place to achieve that. We only have until the end of this Parliament, then it's too late. But that initiative hasn't come from the Government. They haven't approached this party or the Labour Party. They're determined to go their own way, and they're not making a success of it. Cabinet Secretary. I, that can be patently refuted. I have met with the opposition parties in this place. I have done that in this session, as I did previously, as have the, the ministers on these benches. So that is just factually incorrect. But let me look at the, the claim about the cost of employing agency staff in Scotland's NHS, which was the basis of Ruth Davidson's attack. Um, when in, the NHS in England spent a staggering £3.7 billion on locum nurses and doctors last year, up £400 million on the previous year. Now, I'm clear that agency spend here is too high and we want to reduce it, but the fact remains that agency spend here in Scotland is very low at 2% of the overall staffing budget. And, of course, in any organisation the size of the NHS, you will occasionally have to use temporary staff to fill short term gaps in the workforce. But we are working very closely with boards to reduce that. But the fact remains that Scotland spends proportionately one third of what is spent on agency staff in England. So I think Mr Cameron would do well to heed the very wise words which are on the record of Jackson Carlaw when he was health spokesperson. 
I want to be very clear about the record of this government on staff numbers. In Scotland, we are better equipped to deliver services than we have ever been. But yes, there are challenges, absolutely. In this, under this government, NHS Scotland staffing has risen to an historically high level of over, by over 11,000 staff. I will in a minute. By over 11,000 staff. Consultant numbers are at a record high, with almost 5,200 in place, a 42.9% increase under this government. Nursing and midwifery staff have increased by 4.6%. And also, let's be clear, 96% of medical training places in Scotland are filled, with fill rates for GP training up 4% on last year. And on that point, I'll take your intervention. John Good. Scott. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And on that point of staff numbers, would, the, would you note the growing difficulty in getting appointments within NHS Ayrshire and Arran and elsewhere following GP referrals and the increasing number of times the 12-week waiting time is not just being breached, but indeed utterly ignored by NHS Ayrshire and Arran? Shona Robson. Well, I do acknowledge that there are some of these posts that are particularly difficult to fill. Some specialties are difficult to fill, and in some geographic areas, they're particularly difficult to fill, which is why, of course, in the National Clinical Strategy, we talk about the need to look at appointing uh, specialist staff on contracts that cover more than one site, making it more attractive to recruit them uh, to uh, a district general hospital, possibly linked to a teaching general hospital. So we are looking at all ways of making those posts more attractive and we have had some success with that. I recognise also uh, the particular challenges we have within general practice, which is why there has been such a key focus for me personally and this government on that and of course extensive uh, efforts made through the Primary Care Transformation Fund, the £85 million investment over the next three years, the fact that we are working with the BMA on a new GP contract from 2017 onwards, the fact we have got rid of the quaff and all the bureaucracy that goes with it. So it is absolutely unfair for Donald Cameron to claim that we have not been giving primary care and general practice the priority that it needs. Of course, we have. Now, while we have the highest number of GPs per head of population, uh, in the UK and of course that number has risen to an all-time high we recognize we need to do more and we need more GPs we accept that but it's not all about securing numbers we've increased the training places for GPs I will in a second we've increased the training places for uh, GPs to grow our GP workforce encouraging trainee doctors into general practice helping to make general practice a more attractive option and encouraging established GPs uh, to return to practice. But we need to do more. Uh, we accept that, that we need to have the multidisciplinary team around GPs, and that's what we are uh, working to do. But it is not simply a numbers game, and I'll, I'll give way on that point. Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. The multidisciplinary team will, of course, consist of midwives and health visitors. And in Glasgow, the Healthier, Wealthier Children initiative has had a significant impact on the health of those at risk of poverty. Um, they've received over £11 million in benefits that they might otherwise not have known about if it hadn't been for those well-informed uh, midwives and health visitors. So will the government commit to Green Manifesto calls that that scheme be rolled out across Scotland? Shona Robson. Yes, I can say to Alison Johnson, I, I very much welcome the contribution made by uh, health visitors, midwives and others through the, the Healthier Wealthier Children's Project, which of course we've funded. And I think the role of the NHS staff and their partners in income maximisation is something that we need to make sure in tackling health inequalities that everybody sees it as part of their role to do so. So yes, I can uh, commit to uh, support the, the rollout of that and we can build that in through the, the workforce plans as we take that forward. I think the multidisciplinary model we have for primary care with the link workers and others really lends itself very well to seeing uh, part of that as tackling health inequalities and income maximisation uh, also. Um, NHS boards are, of course, required to have the correct staff to meet the needs of the service and ensure high-quality patient care. We are working very closely with boards, um, in, 
of course, through the uh, new world of integration, to support their efforts on workforce planning and recruitment. And of course, uh, we will work with the RCGP, the BME, and others to uh, the RCN and others to take that forward. We have a vision through the National Clinical Strategy, and I intend to introduce proposals for a regional and national planning system in a draft National Healthcare Workforce Plan by the end of the year, with the plan, plan published in the spring of next year. And I can assure our uh, stakeholders... So too late, Mr Rowley. Sorry? Sorry, Cabinet Secretary. Mr Rowley was looking into, to intervene. I told him it was too late. Oh, right. OK, sorry. Um, yes, so we will c uh, consult widely on that workforce plan um, and the, the draft of, of which I've, I've just announced. Uh, safe staffing uh, in law, of course, we'll be taking that forward. Uh, very, very important. And again, that was something in the programme for government. We have a commitment to maintain tuition and bursaries for nurses and midwives. Again, something that the UK government has ditched. So in conclusion, yeah, uh, please. <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, we value uh, the, the work of all of our uh, NHS and care staff, whether they originate from Scotland or elsewhere, and of course our EU citizens who work in Scotland, who account for approximately 5% of the workforce, uh, make a huge contribution, and we want to do everything we can to can make sure they continue to work here in the NHS and our care services. Uh, presiding Officer, I hope this afternoon is a productive and constructive Constructive debate. I will continue to work with other parties uh, on uh, the NHS and our care services, but that's a two-way street. And what I would expect other parties to come forward with is constructive proposals. Please. I hope we hear a bit more of that this afternoon than we've heard so far. Could you move the amendment, please, Cabinet? Did you? Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Anna Sarwar uh, to speak to and move Amendment 1554.2. And you have around seven minutes, please, Mr Sarwar. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I must say, having listened to the Health Secretary, that it is now becoming clearer by the day that Scotland's NHS, the patients who rely on it, and the staff who work in it are being let down by this government and by this Cabinet Secretary. First, let's accept reality. Let's accept reality. The NHS is already independent in Scotland. This Scottish Government sets its budget. This Scottish Government decides its priorities and oversees its delivery. So it's time to stop attempting to shift the blame and instead accept the responsibility that you have been in charge for almost 10 years. I want just now, the crisis that we currently see in workforce planning have happened not despite this Government, but because of this Government's record and their decisions. Now, the uh, Cabinet Secretary chooses to use Jeremy Hunt's record as her measure of success. I've got to say, is that the limit of our ambition for Scotland and the limit of our ambition for Scotland's NHS? I give it to the Health Secretary. She is better than Jeremy Hunt. But I hardly think being the second worst Health Secretary in the UK is much of a compliment. Because we've heard a lot today about the failures in England and Wales. But isn't it surprising that we have a Scottish Health Secretary responsible for Scotland's NHS as part of the Scottish Government, as a member of the Scottish National Party, who wants to endlessly talk about failures in England, but not talk about what's happening here in Scotland? And there is a reason why. Because this Health Secretary, because this Health Secretary laughs at the failures rather than takes it seriously. Patients' treatments undermined, staff undermined, and the Health Secretary finds it funny. I'll take the intervention. Shona Can you just Robson. clarify, are you going to be voting with the Tories tonight? Oh. I, I'll, tell you who I'll, be, I'll tell you who I'll be voting for tonight. I'll be voting for our NHS workforce who are dedicating their lives working for a National Health Service, who this Health Secretary is letting down every single day. Because after almost 10 years of a sticking plaster approach, we are seeing the consequence of this government. Consequences on patient care and consequences for our overworked, undervalued and under-resourced NHS workforce. So please don't stand here and use those dedicated everyday heroes as cover for your failures. The absolute mess in workforce planning has let them down and they deserve more than just the Minister's warm word or her fake moral outrage today. Because we know all is not well in our NHS. Today in Scotland, there are massive numbers of vacancies across 
health boards. In both primary care and in hospitals, the number of vacancies left unfilled by this government is leading to the expected standards of patient care being missed, and it's getting worse. Today, there are 2,500 nursing and midwifery vacancies in our NHS going up, not down. Within that, 300 mental health nurse vacancies, and that is meant to be a priority for this government. And this is a direct result of decisions taken by this government. When Nicola Sturgeon was health secretary, she actually cut training places for nurses and midwives, and this is now coming back to haunt our hospitals. Let me quote, this widening gap in staffing is not sustainable and puts even more pressure on existing staff who are working flat out on a ward and across communities. Nursing staff are unable to provide the care they would like to, and the last NHS staff survey showed that only one quarter of nursing and midwifery staff feel that there are enough of them to do their staff their job properly. Not my words, Deputy Presiding Officer, but the words of the Royal College of Nursing in Scotland. And what is the consequences of this failure? More stress and more strain on our already overworked and overstressed staff. One in 20 of our workforce off on sick at any one time. That is the equivalent of six MSPs being off sick indefinitely. We would not accept that as tolerable for our place of work. Why is that acceptable for our NHS workforce? And what has it meant? It's meant a massive rise in private agency spend, 600% increase in the health secretary's own area of private agency nursing. And one, I, sorry, I apologise, 600% across the country, 1,000% in the cabinet secretary's own area, £25 million of taxpayers' money going last year because this government can't do their job properly. And the situation with GPs is not any better. Our primary care sector, for most the front line in our NHS, is in crisis. Every day we hear of the challenges that our GPs are facing. And again, a direct result of decisions taken by this government. £1.6 billion of cuts in primary care. And the consequences, one in four GP practices reporting a vacancy. One in four training places for GPs unfilled. Record numbers of early retirements, 277 in Greater Glasgow and Clyde alone. Practices closing, 17 in Greater Glasgow and Clyde alone. And too many GP practices lists closed too. I notice the silence now when the hard facts are presented <laughs> to this government. GP practices increasing turning to locums to cover, but in some cases unable to secure the locums they need. And according to the RCGPs, a desperate need for additional GPs to meet demand. 830 GPs by 2020. The government have taken too long to recognise they have a problem and now not doing enough to solve it. But the mess doesn't stop there. We have over 400 whole-time equivalent consultant vacancies too in our hospitals, directly affecting patient care. So to conclude, presiding officer, He's the mess Ms. in the NHS is of this government's own making. A complete and utter failure to properly workforce plan. Nursing vacancies up, midwifery vacancies up, GP vacancies up, consultant vacancies up, waiting times up, private agency spend up, and this workforce crisis is no longer sustainable. It's time the Cabinet Secretary listened, woke up and acted for the NHS, and I formally move the amendment in my name. You're in we now move to... Could I have some quiet, please? Could I have some quiet and some respect for backbenchers coming up, please? I did say please, I may not next time. We now move to open speeches of around six minutes and it's fairly tight. So um, can I please call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you. I welcome the opportunity to speak about the crucial issue of health. Presiding officer, I recognise the challenges in our National Health Service. Importantly though, I also recognise the responsibility we all have to work constructively to tackle these challenges, something some of the language today isn't really contributing to. Staffing numbers are important. 
The link between safe and sustainable staffing levels and high quality care is well established. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to enshrining safe staff levels in law, work on which will begin this year, as well as the cross-party support for such a move. Presiding officer, a point I would... <laughs> Presiding officer, a point I would gently ask members to reflect on in relation to, in relation to staffing, recruitment and retention is the importance of highlighting where we can areas of good work and practice. We should perhaps ask ourselves if all folk here is cries of doom, gloom and crisis, whether it's likely they're going to want to work in that area and perhaps a constant narrative of what's only going wrong damages more than it fixes. Presiding officer, we know that an ageing population is one major issue facing the NHS in this country. And while our population are living longer, their health and social care needs are greater for longer periods in their lives. But with the health of all citizens being so inextricably linked to their socio-economic situation, perhaps an even bigger issue facing, facing our NHS is that of deep-seated health inequalities. Inequalities stemming from wider issues of generational poverty and deprivation whole communities experiencing poor health and prolonged issues. That inequality is brought into sharp focus when looking at life expectancy figures in my own constituency, Cunningham South. The highest rates of male life expectancy are found in an area called Whitehurst Park in Colwinning, at almost 84 years old. The lowest rate occurs in Fullerton in Irvine, with an expectation of life at 66 years for newborn males. This is a difference of 17 and a half years these communities are only a short distance apart, probably about five miles or so. Presiding officer, I think we need to be really clear to provide the healthcare system we all aspire to requires much more than increased staffing levels and a fixation on numbers. To quote the SCVO, challenges of historic and deep-rooted health inequalities can only be met by switching focus to preventative methods, tackling economic inequality and empowering people to make choices about the care they receive. And this is exactly what our new health and social care partnerships aim to deliver. These represent a radical integration of health and social care, perhaps the most radical reform in health care in Scotland since the formation of the NHS. As well as better addressing the needs of older people, major users of health and social care services, a shift to community services paves the way to empower a truly community health service, working with integrated authorities, social care, community care, primary care and general practice to deliver the reforms needed for successful community health services. Supporting the shift in the balance of care away from acute settings towards primary and community is not just about access to GPs, but to multidisciplinary teams of professionals centred around those GPs. It's also about raising awareness of where is the right place to get help and managing pressures on GPs and hospitals. I welcome the commitment of the government to recruit up to 250 community link workers to work in GP surgeries during the lifetime of this parliament. Returning to my own constituency, I would quite like to highlight some of the recent good work of our health and social care partnerships locally. The co-winning locality planning forum identified the following priorities, to engage with local early years nurseries to hear directly from parents, to introduce GP visiting sessions in local nursing homes, and to make occupational therapy advice available in the local pharmacy. Irvine Locality Forum has prioritised addressing issues of social isolation, which we know impacts on people's health, to improve low-level mental health and wellbeing, particularly among young people, and to improve access to local physiotherapy for those with musculoskeletal concerns. Locally agreed priorities and actions, a new way of working in and with the community, and I look forward to watching them progress. Presiding officer, much of today's debate will focus on our health staff and highlights the important role that these workers play in society. In commending the dedication, professionalism and commitment of these workers, I'd like to mention the contribution of EU citizens to that workforce. As the Cabinet Secretary said, a considerable number of our um, workers come from elsewhere in the, in the EU. 14,000 people in our health and social care sector. Presiding officer, I'll conclude by saying that we greatly value the work of EU citizens in NHS, social care and across Scotland. Their contribution to our society is valued. I look forward to continuing to support the Scottish Government as it works to ensure that their rights and place in our nation and NHS workforce are protected as we continue to develop and improve Scotland's health service.
I call on Brian Whittle to be followed by Sandra White. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I start by thinking how interesting it was to hear the Health Secretary pretend to support cross-party collaboration and then accuse Labour of perhaps voting with us. I think we can draw our own conclusions as to her sincerity. Um, I, I spent the parliamentary research, uh, recess researching health inequality, its causes and long-term solutions. I had the opportunity to speak with many organisations with knowledge of this topic, including medical organisations like the BMA, GMC, SAMH and the Royal College of Midwifery. These conversations highlighted several issues directly related to health inequality and its implications for the NHS workforce. Shortages in GPs, nursing staff, mental health specialists and consultants were a consistent theme. Take midwives, for example. We have a chronic shortage of midwives in many areas across Scotland, but vacancies for newly qualified midwives are not being properly advertised or filled. According to the Royal College of Midwifery, and I quote, it seems a lot of midwives have been offered bank jobs instead of substantive posts. They should have been offered permanent posts, so it's a bit of a fudge. With so many midwives set to retire in the next few years, yet at the same time, many of Scotland's newly qualified midwives are looking elsewhere to build their careers thanks to a lack of opportunity and, crucially, job security in Scotland. We need them to work in our NHS. When it comes to primary care, our GPs are the front line, not only for treatment, but for health education and tackling health inequality. If we get the right support and resources to our GP practices, they can take some of the pressure off of our secondary health care. Turning GP surgeries into community health care hubs is wholeheartedly supported by the Scottish Conservatives. Not, having, not just having GPs, but a range of expertise in areas such as mental health, physiotherapy and nutrition under one roof would allow patients to receive more targeted treatment faster, reducing the need for secondary treatment at hospitals. Healthcare professionals tell us that what they want most is to have the time they need to treat the patients without feeling like they're watching the clock. Time is the reality of what we're debating today. Time to be able to give a longer term, substantial and ultimately a more beneficial intervention for their patients. Consistent and sustainable staffing and retention speaks directly to increased time with patients. Also, as I have already discussed in this chamber, preventable disease costs our NHS in Scotland several billion pounds a year and a monumental amount of time. According to many within the health service, the epidemic of preventable disease is the greatest danger to the survival of our NHS in the next 20 or 30 years. And this government and this parliament needs to start paying better attention to this. Type 2 diabetes linked to obesity and inactivity and also an increasing cause of amputation and blindness is costing our NHS over £1 billion a year, 12% of the Scottish health budget. Osteoarthritis and other musculoskeletal conditions costing some £354 million a year in Scotland, a condition exacerbated by obesity and inactivity. And the rise of poor mental health, which according to mental health organisations like SAMH, can often be prevented by encouraging lifestyles with greater physical and mental activity and fostering a culture of inclusivity. Heart, chest and stroke conditions continue to be a major cause of deaths in Scotland, again often linked to inactivity and obesity. Despite consistent investment, despite a real desire and commitment to tackle these issues, health inequality and the attainment gap continue to grow. Albert Einstein says we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Yet for years, governments of all stripes have taken an attitude towards the NHS that has focused on doing more of the same with added money. The health of the nation does not exist in a vacuum. It will take collaboration across the chamber and across portfolios to effectively set a path to a healthier Scotland. Without the development of a structured and progressive active healthy lifestyle programme accessible to all, health inequality and therefore the attainment gap cannot be closed. Lack of understanding regarding choices available, lack of finance, disability, being a member of the LGBTI community are among the many issues cited as barriers to participation in an active lifestyle. This parliament can start to remove those barriers. We can take the hard decisions thinking longer term or we can decide that these issues are too difficult to tackle because we don't quite understand them, or we've got an election to think about, or perhaps a const constitutional issue to chew on and leave them for the next parliament to deal with. Of course. Marie Todd. 
I'd like to ask my colleague across the chamber to perhaps reflect and um, consider the effect that the welfare reform um, measures brought in by the UK Parliament have had on the very groups that he's just mentioned and the very fact that health inequality, as you are alluding, is related to wealth inequality. Brian Whittle. I, I, know, I know with interest we throw it back down to Westminster again. Now, in the words of Larry Page, the Google founder, if you choose a harder problem to tackle, you will have less competition. This government's insist insistent tinkering around the edges with our health of our nation reminds me of a quote from Montgomery Scott, chief engineer on the Starship Enterprise, when he said, the more they overthink the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain. I say to this government, stop what you're doing. It's not working. The plumbing's backed up. Do something better. The Scottish Conservatives commit to giving our health service the resources and structure to recruit and retain a workforce, allowing them the time to take the lead in tackling preventable conditions so we can once and for all shed the unwanted tag of the sick man of Europe. Sandra White to be followed by Neil Finlay. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And like other members have said uh, previously, I, mean, I recognise the demands being put on the National Health Service, including primary care and general practice. And uh, I too commend uh, all the workforce uh, in our health service. And I do mean all of the workforce, from the porters, domestic staff, etc., all the way up. Because without all of them, the health service would not be able to operate. So I thank them very much for their hard work and their dedication. Uh, presiding officer, when I read the Tory motion, I generally had to shake my head. Uh, here is a party, a party across here, supporting an austerity agenda, leading to massive budget cuts, which directly affects our most vulnerable people. And whose party in Westminster is presiding over the biggest crisis in the health service in England? All I can say is, thank goodness, thank goodness, you are not in charge in this Scottish Parliament. That is one thing we desperately don't need in that respect. Now, I know that the Tories and Labour as well, obviously, I heard Anis Sarwar's contribution. I'll come back to perhaps Anis Sarwar shortly. Uh, they don't like to be reminded of various things that's happening, but I do think it's worth reiterating and worth listening to the difference between the health service in Scotland and that in other areas of the UK. Scotland's core a &E department have outperformed the rest of the UK for the last 17 months. Fact. If Scotland's GP ratio was the same as England, we would have 931 fewer GPs, a reduction of 19%. Fact. Indeed, we have the highest number of GPs per head of population. Fact. Agenda for change staff are better paid in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK. That's another fact. Entry pay band is £881 more than in England. And in Northern Ireland, it's £1,300 more. Fact. We have maintained no, this is a very, very important fact, we have maintained no compulsory redundancies policy in the NHS, whereas in England there have been 19,650 compulsory redundancies since 2010. Now that is the reality of the NHS under the Tories. And if, you know, I just want to come in to Mr Sarwar's contribution. I just want to say to Mr Sarwar and his contribution, I won't take any lessons from the Labour Party who actually went over, who represented the people of Glasgow in Westminster, in Holyrood and the council, the most deprived areas in Glasgow. And you didn't improve one single thing. So I won't take any lessons from yourself also, basically. The presiding officer, I want to look at perhaps a bigger picture, and some people have already actually touched on that particular part, uh, you know, across Scotland, and that is the preventative me uh, measures. And I do believe that the SNP government and governments previous to that, administrations as they were called then, you know, they did actually do their best to lead the way. But I think the SNP have picked up in this very, very well, because prevention it's the best way forward. Might not get a, a result tomorrow, but in the long run, it'll be the best way forward altogether. Now, let's look at some of the prevention measures that we've been looking at. The breast screening programme for 50 to 70-year-old uh, women every three years. 
even women over 70 years of age can self-refer themselves to the breast screening programme, the bowel screening programme, which I was delighted to help launch along with Alec Neal when he was the Health Secretary. That has been a fantastic success. And I see that Mr Sarwar is, as usual, in himself, turning his back to the presiding officer and the chair. Perhaps the presiding officer would like to say something, but I note... He is absolutely That's not interested whatsoever. Just what? I'll point that out for you then, presiding officer. Cervical screening, that has been a fantastic success as well. Routinely, routinely for 50 to 64 year old women every five years. It's fantastic. The flu immunisation programme, the abdominal aortic aneurysm, which is just a new one out, is absolutely fantastic as well. It's all about prevention. And let's not forget about one of the really great success stories, I think, of this parliament, of this Scottish Government. And that is the free school meals programme, which actually is doing a fantastic job in ensuring that kids who come from areas that can't afford it are getting a nutritional meal. And that is something we should all be very, very proud of, helping to obviously reduce poverty, but actually improve their diet as well. So in conclusion, presiding officer, others have mentioned uh, various organisations. So I'd just like to mention a couple also quotes from them as well. The SCVO, which Ruth Maguire has already mentioned, the SCVO says, preventing problems from degenerating into crises or preventing problems arising in the first place should remain a priority. Given that it delivers better outcomes for the people who use the services, it also saves the public sector monies. And if I could quote from the RCN, they mention the fact that community health visiting and district nursing teams offer core health care services across communities, delivering care to people of all ages in their homes and local areas. The Scottish Government is already investing in health visiting, which provides universal services for children up to the age of five. I think that's a pretty good success story, presiding officer. Thank you. Neil Finlay to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thanks, President Officer. And can I declare an interest in it? Both my wife and daughter work, for the, work in the NHS. Um, every day we see and hear of our NHS and social care system under huge and increasing pressure. We have a GP crisis, not one that's coming, but one that's here and it's here now. Uh, is it really a surprise to learn that if you cut the GP budget and leave the service short of almost 1,000 uh, doctors, you end up in the state we're in, uh, with, in my region of Lothian, 39 practices with closed or restricted lists. Is it a surprise that we hear from nurses, mental health professionals, clinicians, physios, OTs, etc., the same plea for someone, anyone, to address the staff shortages that they're all experiencing? All of these people have a burning desire to do the best for the patients they care for. But all the while, they're being worn down by the pressures, the shortages and the decline in staff morale, whilst their services are propped up by agency staff, locums, bank staff and the private sector. And my fear is that this is only going to get worse. I spoke with NHS Lothian today uh, and they are trying to find 90 million of so-called savings and next year it will be 60 million. This is a 6 to 7 per cent cut year on year and yet the government claims it is not cutting NHS budgets but if health inflation is 6% and boards are only getting 1.7% then that surely is a cut and on top of this the government cuts things like the drugs and alcohol support budget then tells boards they have to make up the shortfall I'll give way to the cabinet secretary if she can tell me where they're going to get that money to make up the shortfall? Well, we've been very clear with boards. Sure, no, um, many of the boards have already maintained the same level of alcohol and drug funding, and we're working with those, those other boards to make sure that the level of service continues. And many boards have already done that, so I would hope that Lothian would follow suit. NHS Lothian Neil told, me, Finlay. told me today they have no money to fill that gap in the budget, and I absolutely understand why. Um, one of the most pressing issues we face is in mental health provision. This year, uh, NHS Lothian reported just 44% of patients needing psychological therapies had been seen within the 18-week waiting time. 126 people had to wait for over a year. And dementia support 
I have had constituents wait up to 380 days, 380 days for post-diagnosis support. And this week we saw the health survey, uh, the link between, in the health survey, the link between deprivation and poor mental health. And this gets to the crux of the issue, the health inequalities that scar our country. And I see real, no real concerted cross-government effort to address this. Where is the redistribution to eliminate the root causes of health inequality? Poverty. Why do we see councils who are the, in the front line of that fight having their budgets slashed? I didn't hear Sandra White mention that Glasgow has got one of the worst local government settlements of any council in the country. How is that going to address health inequality? Yes. Sandra White. And the member for taking the intervention. Just to correct you there, Glasgow City Council has the highest investment of any mainland council. And perhaps if your Labour colleagues on Glasgow City Council spent it on things that meant to people in need, they may have get somewhere. Neil Finlay. What a, what a pathetic response that is. You're supposed to be there representing the great city of Glasgow, demanding more resources for your constituents, and you're overseeing a crisis in local government in the city. That's what you are there doing. And why are we, why are policies that are, uh, where are the policies that are meant to be putting meaningful, long-term, sustainable resources into these communities? Why, for example, as in my region, the Blackburn Local Employment Scheme, an employment scheme for young people in one of the most needy, needy communities in the region, threatened with closure because of cuts to the skills budget. What impact will that have on the health and well-being of young people in that area? And isn't it a scandal that the Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown, responsible for that project, won't even meet with me and the people who run it to discuss it? I got a letter last week refusing a meeting. President officer, this parliament has powers to raise funds and end the cuts. The government is making the political choice not to, and their health care system is suffering. But the biggest failure of all, I believe, is in social care. Last week, the health committee heard from 25 social care workers. Their words should make us all sit up and take notice. They said they don't feel valued by society or by their employers, but they do feel valued by their clients. They said, no, I'm in my last minute. Um, it's too far on, thank you. They said there is never enough staff. They don't get paid for travel time or gaps between visits. They have to, some of them have to buy their own uniforms, pay for their own mobile phone calls. Many said induction training was at best patchy. They asked, who supports the carers' well-being? Many of my colleagues are suffering from the effects of drugs, alcohol or depression. And they quite rightly asked, how on earth are we going to attract the carers of tomorrow? on the terms and conditions that we receive. You come uh, to a close, I know, please, finally, Mr. Finally, President Officer, I have to say that I had hoped that in this debate the Tory party would have showed some uncharacteristic humility. The party that has cut public spending with relish, its members cheering on Cameron and Osborne's every budget, now here in the chamber with the brass neck to pose as the great defenders of the NHS. Mr Cameron, who moved the motion, should have had the common decency at least to look embarrassed. Gil Patterson to be followed by Jamie Green. Thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, only last week I spoke in a Labour health debate on local services, which in itself was a bit ironic, but today it's something else. We are here to debate on a so-called national health crisis. I should take the opportunity really to check if this debate is not meant for Westminster. And I needed to check as a crisis and no confidence from the motion as the words being uttered by patients, families and professionals in regard to the current situation in the Tory-run NHS England and its colleague Jeremy Hunt. However, hold the presses. The Tories had come across a report showing, according to Ruth Davidson, Scot Scotland's NHS is facing pockets of meltdown. This report linked it to an article that hospital accident and emergency performances is now the worst it has ever been, and that in another story, we ended the last financial year reporting the largest deficit in the NHS history. Doesn't sound good at all for Scotland. However, as the Cabinet Secretary said, out of the 94 hospitals used in the report, only three 
were from Scotland, namely Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, Nine Wells in Dundee, and Rigmore in Inverness. But what the Cabinet Secretary didn't say, when it comes to the accident and emergency performance, the relative statistics for the referred Scottish hospitals areas are NHS Grampian at 96.7%, NH Highland at 97.5%, and NH Tayside on a phenomenal 99.2%. 99.2%. Nationally, the core of the a &E services for Scotland overall in June was 95%, compared to the under 86% in Tory run England and under 79% in Labour run Wales. Overall, Scotland's core a &E departments have outperformed the rest of the UK for the last 17 months. In regards, you would have a cheek. Oh, sorry, I, no, I take that. Sorry, no, <laughs> Alex apologies. Cole Hamilton. I, I mistook you for a Tory. Uh, carry on. That's never happened before. Thank you. I thank the uh, member for giving way. Um, would the member please tell the chamber how this constant misdirection as to what is happening in, in other parts of the United Kingdom should make up for the fact that there are patients languishing in, on waiting lists and in hospitals in the jurisdiction in which you have been in power for the past 10 years? Gil Patterson. Well, I think the colleague pointed that out. Thank God it says it's in power, to be quite honest, because under your record, that's the stats I'm, I'm actually quoting. You know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what performance uh, indicator you want to look at. This government outperforms anybody, including your own, to be quite honest. Uh, in regards to the aforementioned Arthur deficit, when, the, the, the visit, when you visit the actual story, the headline reads, NHS hospitals in England reveal a two and a half billion uh, record deficit. The original references to meltdown is uh, targeted at Tory run NHS England. But here we are debating a report that has no relevance in Scotland. From the motion, I agree, and I, I sincerely agree, to commend the staff across NHS Scotland for their hard work and dedication. During the terms of this government, we have seen our staff ensure our hospitals are cleaner and safer. There have been major reductions in the number of hospital-acquired infections since 2007. Cases of C. diff in patients aged 65 and over have reduced by a whacking 86%, and cases of MRSA have reduced by 87%. NHS Scotland has one of the safest healthcare systems in the world, with record low infection rates and an internationally recognised patient safety programme. In regards to investment in primary care, I'm proud to say my own constituency has ben benefited significantly as big, big investments in the Golden Jubilee Hospital. And it is a result of a, a tremendous effort on, me on many, many people. The previous finance secretary, who played no small part in, it, in this effort himself, was able to announce not only that a new, much needed health centre in Greenock, which is not in my constituency, will be built but that, as part of a combined capital investment of £38 million, a new Clyde Bank health centre will be, will, will be built, which is in my constituency, no thanks. And, I, and this will allow con the continuation of community health services in Clyde Bank. And with mental health provision high on this government's agenda, I understand from NHS uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde that primary mental health services will form part of the new health centre. And as the focal point of primary health care in Clyde Bank, this, for me, only adds to the importance already shown by this SNP government. Despite these positive res results and steps uh, from NHS, Tories both here and in Westminster, through narrow-mindedness and self-worth, have taken Scotland into uncharted waters with approximately 1 in 20 of NHS Scotland's doctors coming from elsewhere in the EU. The Tories are managing to threaten our NHS not just through front door cuts to Scotland's budget, but via the back door using Brexit and threatening the ability to, to recruit health and care staff in the future. To Will conclude, you... President, President yes, Officer, please. 
I think this debate from the Conservatives is a bit rich, and I do think there is a considerable dose of brass necketry uh, calling this debate uh, on health today. Presiding officer, I commend the Cabinet Secretary's amendment to the Parliament. Thank you. Uh, may I remind members that in all contributions they should speak through the chair, and I call Jamie Green to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you. It sounds, listening to the speeches today, that um, Sandra White and her colleagues in those benches really like facts. So here are some facts. Shortfalls in GPs, consultancy vacancies up, nursing vacancies up, agency uses up. Uses up. The problem is, presiding officers, that these are facts that they don't like and are facts that they don't want to listen to. I'd like to talk today about what really matters in this debate, and that is people. And the people involved in this complex, ever-growing and ever-demanding system are the ones really affected by the decisions that we make in this parliament, but also decisions made in the health authorities which manage these services. Now, these people are patients. These people are also nurses, doctors, GPs, consultants and locums, and they themselves paint a picture of the NHS in Scotland today. Now I'll focus much of my speech on the area that I represent, the west of Scotland, because these are people that write to me and tell me their frustrations and their woes and their battles. And before we look at the areas where there is much work to be done, it is entirely right and appropriate that we pay tribute to the staff who work across the NHS for often, if, as we stand here and debate the bigger picture, it is they who are looking after our friends and parents, sons and daughters, neighbours and colleagues. Now, my region is primarily looked after and covered by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and NHS Ayrshire and Arran. And I am deeply troubled by many of the statistics that I read. I'm deeply troubled by the stories that I hear from the people who have contacted me in my short time as an MSP in this place. I have three areas of concern. The first, waiting times and targets. NHS Ayrshire and Arran has seen psychological therapy waiting times sitting at 73% where the target is 90. 73% where the target is 90. What does this actually mean? It's not just a number. These are people who are waiting to see one, someone, a specialist, for things like CBT or talking therapies. These are people who may be suffering from depression or addiction. The overall 18-week referral to treatment target is 90%. It's currently being met at just 74%. And in Inverclyde, one constituency contacted me a few weeks ago to say that she was told of a three-month wait for a mammogram after telling her doctor that she'd discovered an unusual lump. Three months of worry and distress now, after persistent daily phone calls to Inverclyde Royal Hospital, she managed to bring that forward. But it shouldn't have to be he who shouts the loudest gets an appointment. My second area of concern is vacancies. The vacancy rate in North Ayrshire and Arran is double the Scottish average at 16%. Now, yesterday as I walked to this chamber, I chatted with the, the people from Parkinson's charity, uh, standing just metres away from here. And they told me that in Ayrshire, there was just one single Parkinson's consultant, and there should be three. I was told about people who had been waiting 18 months for an appointment. The vacancy rate in that same health board is as follows for consultants. 25% for cardiology, 50% for orthodontics, 22% for child and adolescent psychiatry specialists, and a staggering 35% for geriatric specialists. And these are very, very high numbers in terms of vacancies. I accept that these are specialist areas and that recruitment can be difficult in certain parts of Scotland, but more must and ought be done. It is clear that a culture of poor, uh, I'd like to make some progress, please. It's clear that a culture of poor workforce planning is contributing to this bill. And it is not just an occasional requirement, as the Cabinet Secretary said in her opening statement. The third really important area I'd like to mention today is that of well-being in the west of Scotland. Now, the 2015 health, Scottish Health Survey uh, released yesterday showed that really pitiful progress has been made on this. Two thirds of Scots are classed as overweight, with 28% classed as obese. Very little has changed in seven years. That same survey said that 21% of Scottish adults smoke, whilst it is 17 in England. A quarter of Scots 
are classed as drinking to harmful or hazardous levels. Alcohol-related morbidity, morbidity has increased. It showed uh, in the new Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation data that in my area, Greenock and Paisley are areas which have been consistently among the 5% most deprived in Scotland since 2004. So what has the SNP government done to tackle this after nine years? Well, as we pointed out yesterday, the Scottish Conservatives said that areas uh, across Scotland have seen very little improvement in well-being. And not only that, but we have a First Minister who is Health Secretary, made decisions that result in this crisis, but still refuses to take personal responsibility for the very issues we're standing here discussing today. There's a £60 million black hole in the funding for NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. There's a £30 million black hole in the funding for NHS Ayrshire and Arran. Both of these health authorities have major ongoing problems with delayed discharge. Thousands of days of bed days uh, are, are lost each month. So whilst this debate, in conclusion, will focus on the politics and the policy of the NHS, I sincerely hope that it is the voices of the people of Scotland who are suffering at the hands of after nearly a decade of the SNP in power that we listen to those voices the most. Alison Johnson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Presiding officer, we in this chamber are agreed that the NHS faces serious workforce challenges and it's vitally important that workforce planning is thoroughly scrutinised and we're agreed that no part of our health service is more valuable than its dedicated staff. But the challenges we face, they shouldn't be underestimated. Audit Scotland tell us that we'll see a 50% increase in the number of people aged 75 and over by 2030. So it's essential that workforce planning properly anticipates these pressures and that our approach to an ageing society is a positive one, one that focuses on enabling people to maintain dignity and independence in old age. My party supports parity of esteem for mental health and physical health. And we support the balance of care shifting towards preventative spending but we can't look away from the injurious effects of cuts to both local, local and national government budgets. Cuts can't deliver a properly resourced system of community-based care and social care, so we have to use all the powers this Parliament has to challenge these cuts. And conversations about an ageing society shouldn't obscure the fact that too many people in Scotland aren't living longer. There is a huge disparity in average life expectancies in the most and least deprived parts of, this Scotland, of Scotland. Ruth Maguire pointed this out in her contribution. And the parts of Scotland where staff and resources are under the greatest pressure are often badly affected. And we mustn't let conversations about an ageing population divert our attention from the wealth of compelling evidence which shows the benefits of early intervention and spending on the early years. The Centre for Research on Families and Relationships is a consortium of seven Scottish universities and in March this year they published a paper on financial vulnerability, a clarion call for the government to do stuff that works. And I mentioned earlier the, the Healthier Wealthier Children project within NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Now that's been shown to put money into families' pockets. In six years, over £11 million extra in benefits for thousands of of pregnant women and their families. Now, it will take focused workforce planning to ensure that we have sufficient numbers of midwives and health visitors with enough time to deliver projects like this, but I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's assurance that this initiative will be rolled out across Scotland. Um, and I would also draw her attention to the impact that workforce shortages have on unpaid carers. Young carers in particular deserve the financial support that our Young Carers Allowance proposals could provide. Presiding officer, ambitions for the integration of health and social care are clear. We all want to see services working in a joined up way. But the workforce planning required is complex and we have to ensure by working with organisations like the BMA, the RCGP and the Royal College of Nursing that the models we use are the right ones. The Royal College of GPs, as we've heard, estimates that by 2020, we could have a, for a shortfall of 830 general practitioners. And that's why I give my full support to the college's calls to increase the proportion of NHS spending on general practice to 
A third of GP practices across NHS Lothian have been forced to restrict their lists, and in some parts of Edinburgh, up to half of surgeries are unable to register new patients. We are all aware of the challenges. And I do acknowledge that some good steps towards improving GP recruitment and retention have been taken. I welcome the new GP training bursary. I welcome the new Graduate School of Medicine. But these actions are long overdue. And yesterday, Dr Elaine McNaughton from the Royal College of GPs gave evidence to the Health and Sport Committee, as we've heard. And she argues that professionals have spent 10 years highlighting the retirement bulge. Recent studies show that widening access to careers in medicine can improve the care we provide to communities which are typically under, under, underserved and under-resourced. I call on the government to ensure that a more diverse range of young people are able to enter health professions, and I acknowledge that that is recognised in the government's motion. Flexibility on university entry requirements is another way to deliver a more diverse body of medical graduates. And we badly need to do more to retain the doctors who are trained in Scotland. I welcome the 27% rise in junior doctors applying to train here, but we can't deny that many of the doctors we train do relocate. And we need to have a realistic approach to workforce planning, which acknowledges that complexity. So this really highlights the need for welcoming inclusive immigration policies in Scotland. And I'm deeply concerned about the impact that withdrawing from the EU could have on our ability to recruit and retrain health and social care staff. And that is why I have to say it is surprising to see this motion tabled by a party who have done so much to jeopardise the careers of doctors, nurses and social care staff from the EU, who have given so much to the NHS, but now have no certainty over, where, where, over, over whether they can remain here. And when a Conservative UK government is overseeing deteriorating services in the Eng English NHS, in the words of Chris Hopson, the chief executive of NHS providers, is increasingly failing to do the job it wants to do and the public needs it to do through no fault of its own. And when junior doctors in England have felt compelled to strike, I do find this a rather unhelpful motion. And Donald Cameron's motion also invites the, the Parliament to express no confidence in the Scottish Government's workforce planning and yet calls on all parties to work together in my view, this is a mixed and unhelpful message and, um, as he would have it, is no answer to this crisis. Presiding officer, in, conclu in conclusion, the Royal College of Nursing have called on all stakeholders, including politicians and health professionals, to put vested interests to one side, to work together for a common cause, to ensure our NHS is sustainable for the future. I believe this is the approach we must take because we won't be able to deliver and develop a sustainable responsive health and social care service if we don't. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me start uh, on a note of consensus that I hope we would all agree with. There isn't a party or a person in this chamber uh, who is going to say we should scrap the NHS and have something different. We're having a debate about how we all wish to improve the performance of the NHS, to support the people in our country uh, with a free, at the point of need, health service. Uh, very much the Chinese model uh, of providing health that goes back thousands of years. You only paid your medical practitioner when you were well and you had access to their skills when they were ill. And that is, in essence, uh, what our NHS uh, is about. Now, of course, uh, the history of how we got to here uh, is a long one. Uh, if we look at uh, death records from the uh, Victorian era, we'll find about 50% of the records uh, show that people died without any medical attendance certifying as to cause of death. Access to health services 150 years ago was a privilege available only to the few. In 1911, uh, Lloyd George uh, introduced an old age pension for the first time, and that started to lay the basis of providing uh, support to people who couldn't necessarily afford to provide it for themselves. Uh, my aunt Stuart uh, registered as a nurse in 1923, a year after the establishment of the nursing register, and her sister uh, the year later. In 1945, my father, at the rather elderly age of 41, graduated 
I will, if you wish. Mr Finlay. Um, maybe every time he gives this speech, could he maybe alert Jackson Carlo and myself that we can leave because we've heard it umpteen times. But I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it'll entertain the new members. Mr Stevenson, a cruel intervention. Oh, I, I, I thought it was one of Mr Neil Finlay's kinder interventions. He is a man not known for his passivity in engaging with his opponents. And I welcome his hostility, as it is a clear indication that I'm on the right path. My, uh, my father, who graduated MBCHB on the relatively advanced age of 41 in 1945, <laughs> was a step in the road. And of course, that was before the establishment of the health service. Uh, he very much welcomed the establishment of the health service. He was the traditional old style GP that we used to have in the 50s and 60s. The front room of the house was the surgery. There were no ancillary staff. His working hours were 7.30 in the morning until nine o'clock at night. And the range of services he could provide and the skills he had were probably substantially less than a nurse practitioner in today's GP practices. So we've come on a very, very long way indeed. Uh, indeed, when I worked as a nurse myself in 1964, the staffing levels we had were substantially worse than they are now. I remember one weekend uh, when we used to work 13 hours a day, Saturday and Sunday, uh, when there were only two of us on duty in the ward when there should have been six. And that wasn't an uncommon occurrence. So things have got better, but they are yet to achieve uh, perfection. We have an aging population. I'm not, thankfully, Bill Patterson, the oldest person speaking in this debate. But I am one of those who might reasonably expect in the near future to make greater calls on the health service. I'm like uh, many of my age group. I'm benefiting particularly from screening programs. Uh, most recently in my case, and I know you all wanted to know this, the bowel screening program. Details will be available at the back of the chamber later. Um, and of course, uh, my wife and others of her age group uh, have for many years been experiencing uh, different kinds of gender-related screening that are appropriate to them. Because I think Brian Whittle was absolutely right. Uh, preventative care is a very important part of achieving health for us. Now, I want to just say a word or two about rural services, because a lot of my constituency is essentially a rural constituency. When uh, I first got elected in 2001, dentistry in the northeast of Scotland, I found it impossible to get either a national health service dentist or even a private dentist. Such was the shortage. But now we have a good dental health service, in part uh, because of actions by the previous administration, continued and supported by the present administration, but threatened by Brexit, because most of the new dentists have come from Poland. They're excellent dentists, they're highly respected and valued uh, by people uh, in their communities. And that is, of course, a pattern that's repeated uh, right across the way. And of course, in dentistry, well, my first dentist was unqualified. So in dentistry, too, uh, we have made enormous uh, progress. It's worth saying, uh, presiding officer, too, that it's increasingly difficult to get GPs to work in rural practices. We have many more GPs, but it is difficult to get them to work in GP practices in rural areas because the work's harder, it's more diverse, uh, and it takes more time. So I very much welcome the support that has been given uh, from Grampian Health Board and the government to them uh, in looking for more GPs to work in rural areas. Particularly GPs in training, we've got training practices, they learn a lot and realise that living in a country location is both good for their personal health, their mental health, their physical health, but also an opportunity to support people in communities uh, right across uh, rural areas. I just say one final thing, Presiding Officer. Very uh, brief final let, thing. Let, let's get the Tories really on message uh, on preventative care. Let's get them supporting minimum pricing for alcohol. That would be a good start. I could give you another dozen if I had time. Thank you. Call Daniel Johnson, followed by James Dornan. Mr Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. So with a little bit of trepidation, I follow after Stuart Stevenson. Um, I don't quite know how I'll follow that, but let me make an attempt. When you think of a doctor, I think you think of a GP. I think we can all picture ourselves in the GP office, 
sitting there it might be with a degree of trepidation waiting for an injection. It might be with a, a degree of hope, hoping that it will put your mind at rest, that the symptoms you've been worrying about for the last few months aren't as bad as you might fear. Or maybe it's frustration trying to hold down your child as the GP takes his temperature. Because the reality is this, it's the family doctor, the GP that is the guardian of our health service. And we love the health service. It looks after us, it looks after our families. And it's our GPs that are the gatekeeper to accessing that health service and who provide the continuity of care. And indeed, it's GPs that are the future of the NHS. We've heard a lot so far in this debate about the integration of services, about preventative therapies. And indeed, Alison Johnson, I think, was right to point out that the, the pressures and uh, the requirements that an ageing population will place on primary care. But those things do take resource. And without wishing to use the euphemism of resource, that means money and people. And we've talked a lot about facts in this debate, and the facts are these. The RCGP estimates that, in real terms, funding for primary care has fallen by over a billion pounds. And you know, I welcome that Shona Robertson says that primary care is her top priority, but again, in reality, that proportion of spend has fallen from 9.8% to 7.6%. We have a quarter of vacancies for GPs unfilled. And indeed, while the 4% increase in GP training places being filled is welcome, that, that's only taking it up from a third of places being unfilled to 69%. That's not a really a record to be proud of. And look, it's easy to trade telephone number statistics. It's easy to try and claim about billions of pounds worth of investments or cuts. But the reality is this, in primary care, what these things mean is difficulty getting appointments and difficulty to even register for a GP if, if, if you're moving into a new area. And that leads to pressure on acute care, at least to pressure in our hospitals. So again, in terms of trying to get to those realities, I held a local summit with uh, local GPs and health board officials because I wanted to do something. Indeed, I probably wanted reassured that maybe things weren't as bad as us politicians were making out. I hope to be told just to, well, there are facts, but don't worry too much. But it was worse than that. They were using the word crisis more than I was. Indeed, I think we all may well be aware of the, the situation of the Southside medical practice, which has hit the headlines recently. They faced a situation where retiring partners, ageing patients, expensive locums, backfilling uh, vacancies, uh, unaffordable premises meant that they had to hand back their practice to the health board, the sixth practice in Edinburgh to do that. And yes, possibly the 5,000 patients they look after could be absorbed by their practice, but all the other practices in our area are full as well. We have half of all GP practices in South Edinburgh are closed to new patients. So we're stuck in a vicious cycle of it being hard to recruit, making the job harder for GPs, putting new doctors off coming in. And the health board officials were painting a pretty difficult picture too. They are being supportive of the practices that are under these pressures. They're wanting to step in, but they, are, they told me they, they lack the simple measures and powers they need. They would like to take on premises, but their lawyers tell them that that would be regarded as speculation. And they, they frankly cannot afford the increased cost of uh, employing GPs directly, which is more expensive than it is employing them through GP practices. So, yes, the, the future of our health service is in primary care. It is about integrating facilities, it's about providing physiotherapy, dentistry, pharmacy on site. It is about having better facilities about having other professionals on site. But we need resource to do that. And indeed, the doctors probably would like that situation too. They, doctors don't want to take on the risks of running a business. They want professional support and they want a good place to work. If we want to attract new GPs, that's what they want. Indeed, probably one of the most worrying lines from the meeting I held was that the GP partnership model is dead. Not my words, but the words of the professionals there. So that's what this parliament needs to do. That's what we need to do, is recognise the issue, not just talk about the telephone numbers, the stats, but recognise that we need to make a change. If we want GPs to do the job that we all value, that we recognise, that we need to make the changes and give the health boards the ability to deal with the situation as it, as it occurs. Because this is a crisis. It is a real crisis. It has a real impact on people, our constituents, and it's not good enough, frankly, to be making comparisons between 
what we have here in other parts of the UK. Not good enough at all, because it doesn't change the reality that our constituents are facing day by day. We need to face up to the situation, we need to empower health boards, and we need to deliver the resource, the training, and the investment that our primary care needs if it's going to face the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. I call James Dornan to follow by Jeremy Balfour. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. You know, some political decisions have you leave you with your mouth hanging open at the sheer lack of self-awareness. James Kelly's relaunch of his relaunch of his repeal of the offensive behaviour two days before the old firm game was one of them. And then there's this. Less than a week after the leader of the opposition raised a debating matter, which seemed to many, as from what I can see on social media, to be a deliberate attempt to mislead the Parliament. On this very subject matter, we have the Tories coming back to this chamber on the same thing. It's, it's strange. I, 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 I want to read to you something, presiding officer, some very, very uncomfortable headlines. The NHS has begun drawing up a formal list of hospital departments which will be closed amid the worst financial crisis in the history of the health service, officials have revealed. Hospitals will embark on a glut of closures with accident and emergency units and key services for the elderly among those stripped out and centralised, NH leaders have said. That's not here in Scotland and it's not under that Cabinet Secretary for Health. That's in the Westminster government, it's the NHS, Jeremy Hunt, and that's who's responsible for that. And that is why they have got such a goal. He, they talked about us being in crisis. They talked about the NHS being in crisis here. We are seeing more and more pressure on staff trying to run harder and harder. We are reaching breaking point, they say, down south. That's the reality, and that's the difference between here and there. While things are getting, ha there, there's a lot of work to be done here, there's a lot of pressure being put on, and there's been absolutely no acknowledgement from this side, which I would understand, nor from that side there, on the pressures that we have to put up with, with the continual cuts from Westminster, with the continual pressures from, from a, ongoing austerity, from welfare inequality, from making sure, we had, we had, we had, we had one of the, I can't remember which one, one of them, the backbenchers was up there saying, sorry, Jamie Green said that uh, we, we have to do more about alcohol, the, the, the problems with alcohol. There is no government in the history of this parliament that has tried harder to take on the curse of alcohol in Scotland than this government. And the party who has stood in the way more than any other party to try and make sure that we can defeat that is this mob over here, although thankfully there wasn't as many of them at that point. I'd be careful with your language, please, Mr Dornan. I don't like the use of the word mob. Is it unparliamentary, President Officer? I think it, it's, it's not. I think it could be more polite while still right, making thank a point. You. Okay, I, I will do. No, I won't take an intervention, not from you. Down, Mr Carlow. Right. Okay, Brian Whittle talked about the sick man of Europe. Now, if you remember, the sick man of Europe, the reputation we have for that, and we've had it deservedly for some time, was not built up in the last 10 years. That sick man of Europe was built up over 60, 70 years. And, and the, the reasons for it, it's a long term. Hope, will you sit down and I'll, I'll give, take an intervention in a minute? Okay. Uh, uh, no, I, I uh, please, through the said, chair, gentlemen, through the chair. Yes. This, uh, it was built up over 60, 70 years and it can't possibly be cured in 10 years, and it can't possibly be cured in 10 years if we've not had the problems to deal with, the, 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 the solutions to deal with it. We're only starting to get some of the powers that will deal with it, and I'm more than happy to take your intervention now. Mr. I to suggest, thank you very much for taking the intervention. I was going to suggest to you that it has been built over a period of time, but over the last 10 years, what has happened with health inequality in this country? Absolutely zip, nothing. You have had no impact at all on the health inequality of Scotland. Hold your head in shame. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Dornan. This, this, I think, is the reason why uh, my language has not been as, as pristine as it usually is, and I apologise, President Officer. I have to hold my head in shame when he's a member of the party who's been in control of our purse strings for hundreds of years. Them and them have been in control of us for hundreds of years. We've never had the powers to be able to take these things on. We've never been, been able to, to grab these problems and deal with them. And he tells us we should hang our head in shame. They're the ones who are bringing in the, the austerity measures. They're the ones who are bringing in welfare cuts. They're the ones who are making sure that the poorest in our country are having to live in worse conditions than they've ever had before. And I'm surprised that people like Neil Finlay and others aren't backing us as opposed to supporting them half the time on this. Yes, I'm more than happy to take Mr. an intervention Finley. from you. Of the powers that the Scottish Government does have, which of them have been redistributive? Mr Dornan. Yes, and it's very difficult to be... 
yeah, it, it's very difficult to be completely redistributive when we don't have all the powers, and we're only getting them just now. That is not the answer. Yes, we, we, we are already. How many, mitigations, how many mitigations have we had to put in on the welfare bill? You know that's rubbish, Neil, but you know, feel free to make silly gestures. Uh, the, the, the Donald Cameron's uh, opening was, was very interesting. I mean, he talked about missed opportunities, and this being a missed opportunity for us to, to make a difference. There was two missed opportunities. One of them was on the 18th of September 2014, and the other one was just a few months ago when we voted to leave Europe instead of stay in Europe. Because I'll tell you, if you think things are bad just now, just wait till the, the Brexit kicks in. And that takes us on to what this is all about. This is all, all but meant to be about staffing in the health service. And if we are going to be trying to staff in the health service, we're not going to be able to do it if what we're doing is banning people, as Stuart Stevenson just mentioned earlier on, from coming here to work. We need the people from Poland, the dentists from Poland. We need the doctors from elsewhere across the world, including Europe. It's, it's what, something like 20% uh, uh, in the, the UK uh, hospital doctors that are from outside of uh, the UK. We need them. We need them. And, we, and what you're doing with your, your immigration laws, with your Brexit, is, is, is you're, you're banning these people from coming here. And you mentioned the Bible. Uh, what was it? The, the, the beam in your eye. I would suggest that the Bible quote that you should have been looking for is let those without sin cast the first stone. Can you wind up, please, Mr. What Don, I would suggest, yes, I will suggest, the presiding officer, is that if we're going to have a debate like this, let's have it honestly, but let's have it based on the fact that they, both sides, accept that we are working under extremely difficult circumstances, that there are issues to be dealt with, but let's not pretend that everything else is rosy and what we are doing is we're sitting on our hands because this Cabinet Secretary has been working very hard to make things better. Uh, thank you very much. I now call... Jeremy Balford, we followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr. Balford, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I agree with Mr. Stevenson that no one in this chamber wants to see the NHS in Scotland fail? We all understand the importance and the place that it has within our society. Our family, our friends, our neighbours, and even ourselves have benefited from the treatment we have received from doctors, nurses, and other professionals. As I mentioned before in this chamber, on at least three or four occasions, the intervention of the NHS has saved my life and allowed me to be here today. Mm -hmm. However, we need to be honest about where the NHS in Scotland is and what its future is. If anyone goes to the doctor, they will often be given the bad news before the good news. They will often be given the diagnosis before the treatment. And the bad news is primary care in Scotland is failing and is in a critical condition. And unless something is done by this government now and in the next few years, we will see more and more GP practices close, GPs walk away and patient care decline. So why is the NHS primary care in Scotland feeling so bad? Well, we've heard many reasons but let me just highlight briefly a few. Firstly, and most obvious, there is a funding issue. Primary care services only get 8% of the National Health Service budget. And this is simply not enough with an ageing population and with many new techniques required. We've heard that in real terms, the amount of money primary care receives has not gone up in the last 10 years under this government. The money is given to hospitals to meet targets set by politicians. And yet even these targets are being missed. Two constituents have contacted me just this week about waiting lists in NHS Lothian. NHS Lothian seems to be disregarding the waiting times given to them by the Scottish Government. One has waited 48 weeks for an appointment with a consultant. The other had got referred by the GP in June and still has no date to go to hospital. Is the minister aware of this? If she is, is she going to intervene in this issue with the management of NHS Lothian? There's a lack of investment in our buildings. GP practices are no longer often fit for the 21st century. It is no longer acceptable to go to an old Victorian house as perhaps Mr Stevenson's father worked in. People need to go to buildings that are disabledly friendly and open to all and good for doctors and good for patients. 
The second reason is that younger doctors are simply deciding not to go into GP practice, but rather enter specialities in hospitals. Younger people want a better life balance than perhaps, again, Mr Stevenson's father. They don't want simply to work all the hours that he did, and often the hospital is a better option for them. Is it too much? <clears throat> it's often GP practices are now having to recruit salaried employees rather than partners within the practice. Again, if you look at the numbers across Scotland, you will see the number of salaried GPs is increasing while the number of partners is going down. And again, the system cannot survive in that. And thirdly, the population in certain parts of Scotland, particularly here in the central belt, is increasing and putting pressure on GP practices. For example, here in Edinburgh, in the last 10 years since this government came to power, 50,000 more people have wanted to register with a GP within Lothian. There are simply not enough spaces left. Let me again give you an example that came in by email to me this Tuesday. I, my constituent said, have spent an hour on the pavement outside my local GP surgery queuing for a registration form. There were about 30 disappointed people who could not register because they only can take on 25 new patients a week. That's not to go and see your GP, but it's simply to register before you want to go and see your right, GP. Right. That cannot be acceptable in 21st century Scotland. Yeah. Let me say, this is not the fault of the GPs, but it's the fault of the government for its lack of strategic thinking and planning. Let me move briefly, uh, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, to what I believe are some of the practical solutions that this can turn us around. Firstly, there needs to be a plan, not a plan for tomorrow, not a plan that will throw some headline money in a certain way, but a plan that will give us uh, a long-term solution that will encourage young doctors into becoming GPs. A solution that will make GP practice something that young doctors want to go into. Secondly, we need to stop asking doctors to keep filling out form after form. I came here on my bus this morning with a GP. He said to me, my job would be so much easier if I didn't have to tick, paper, tick boxes and fill out papers. Doctors became doctors not to be administrators, but to help people with their medical care. Right, right. Deputy Presiding Officer, if you get a tear in a sail when you're sailing, it doesn't matter. It won't affect the boat much. If that tail gets larger and bigger, the boat will become more and more difficult to sail. There is a tear in our NHS in Scotland. The question for this government is, will it let it get bigger and bigger, or will it deal with it in a proper, mature fashion? Thank you. Thank you. I'm calling the last two speakers, Alec Cole Hamilton and Marie Todd will be the last speaker, and it will be Mr Cole Hamilton. A very tight six minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. About 48 hours after I was elected to this place, uh, a very strange thing happened. Um, people in uh, initially single numbers, but then a steadier stream of people emerged at my local office uh, with prescriptions. And attached to this prescriptions was stapled letters from the East Craigs Park Grove Medical Practice saying, help us contact your MSP, we cannot go on like this. I have never heard anything of the like in our nation's capital, that GPs in a popular and well-regarded medical practice should be actively seeking their constituents to contact their elected member of parliament to talk of the abject distress in which their surgery found themselves. And it's not just GPs uh, either, it's other professions as well, whether it's across paediatrics, nursing, allied health professional, midwifery, there is a fundamental and existential crisis in our health service. Yet, we have, all we have here is the government benches saying repeatedly, and the sentiment of this debate, crisis, what crisis? In fact, the government amendment, I find it astonishing that the SNP should seek to amend the motion today by deleting the word serious from advance of the word serious crisis in our healthcare profession. And I think that a measure of how this SNP government regards the problem before it. So we have at every turn, this is a problem 
that manifests itself in our waiting rooms, in our hospitals, in our casualty departments, and the eyes of the entire profession, in fact, the entire eyes of several entire professions, are fixed firmly on an SNP government with its fingers rammed in its ears. Now, just two weeks ago, I raised this directly with the First Minister of Scotland at FMQs. She sought to give me something of a beatdown on this and said, if you half close your eyes and look at it in a certain light, the number of GP trainees was actually at 92% of vacancies. Well, what utter nonsense that turned out to be. The Royal College of GPs with whom I met yesterday and who presented to the Health Committee of the Scottish Parliament, who monitor this situation exceedingly closely, said they had entirely no idea where this figure came from. And in fact, not only that, but the trainees who are in posts at the moment, training to be GPs, 50% of them, this is astonishing, 50% of those trainee GPs are not domiciled in Scotland, yet they are training in Scotland and are not expected to practice in Scotland. So this shows that the government's sole response to this crisis is not working and it needs to be augmented. All told, since Liberal Democrats first raised this problem back in FMQs a year ago, we have lost 90 further GPs to the, to the profession. I'd say that's serious. When half of those trainees are not domiciled in Scotland and not planning to practice in Scotland, I say that's serious. And at this rate, when we will have a thousand fewer GPs than we need by 2020, then I'd say that's pretty damn serious. Now, when you consider the perfect storm of the aging demographic and our surging populations in certain parts of this country, we need to meet invest the investment our GPs put in our communities with proper investment in GPs. Now, 10 years ago, that investment accounted for 9.8% of the health budget. That has diminished to a shocking 7.4% and that's why the Liberal Democrats absolutely support the RCGP's call for an 11% percentage of the overall spend in NHS. But we have to do so much more than this and I offer three particular solutions to the Scottish Government for consider. First thing, we need to box clever. Now, 10%, right now, 10% of all appointments at GPs could actually have easily been dealt with under the minor ailments unit um, in, in terms of the community pharmacists. Yet, most people, a lot of people still aren't aware of that facility available. That's a challenge the SNP have still to meet. Now, 30% of all appointments have something to do with MSK or musculoskeletal conditions. Now, in, as we've seen in Grangemouth, where GPs, by necessity, have had to divert all of their MSK cases into physiotherapists. Uh, we can see a massive reduction in workload as a result of this. And finally, and most importantly on this, is the, is the reality that one in four patients who present to Scottish surgeries do so with underlying mental health conditions. Now, as I said to the First Minister two weeks ago, this is not going to be solved by link workers in surgeries. You need actual fully trained, full-time, qualified mental health practitioners in our surgeries, and not just link workers. They're, they're absolutely fantastic, but they aren't going to solve people, give them that primary care when they need it, as they need it. Secondly, innovation. Now, I do support what the, the Scottish Government are doing with the NUCA model in Forfer. I think there are many examples globally which would see replication well used within the Scottish NHS. And finally, we need to do so much more with planning. Because right now, we have a proliferation of housing developments in my constituency of Edinburgh West. And yet, whilst the SNP are answering the undeniable housing need by building tens of thousands of new homes, they are not building a single new community. And that is because there, is no, there are no new health centres growing with these. So I have written to the Cabinet, your colleague in the Cabinet, to, to ask her to look at uh, planning legislation, to review Section 75 orders, so that we can compel developers to build new health centres so that these can support communities that are otherwise just going to present yet another drain on our already struggling surgeries. And I'll finish here, presiding officer. I'd ask you to finish now, please. Sorry. This is a deadly serious problem. I appreciate that, but you're cutting out time for other well, members. Well, you finished it for me, but it is a deadly serious Thank problem. Thank you very much. We have much. to take it more seriously. Thank you And very that's much. why we'll be supporting their motions. I call Marie Todd, and you've got a very tight six minutes, even tighter than before. And the, as you're the last speaker, all our, everybody else who took part in the debate should be in the chamber for winding up. Just a warning to some who are not here. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First, I have to declare an interest. I'm a pharmacist registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council, and until my election in May, I was employed by NHS Highland. 
During yesterday's debate on the economy, the Conservative member Murdo Fraser urged those of us on this side of the chamber to be less dismal, less miserable, less downbeat and less pessimistic. To be more positive, more cheerful, more hopeful and to show some real leadership in seizing the opportunities for the future. Today, I want to urge my Conservative colleagues to take a dose of their own medicine. Yeah, yeah. And look at some of the success stories in NHS Scotland, as well as the opportunities to innovate. First, let me say that our ageing population is a real success story. People in Scotland are living longer, healthier lives. Nowadays, people with complex medical conditions are living longer and more fulfilling lives at home than ever before. And there are more effective treatments available than at any time. Scotland's NHS is receiving record funding. We have record numbers of staff with the highest number of GPs per head in the UK. Scotland got rid of the much maligned and bureaucratic quaff payment system. And in Scotland, nursing students continue to have free tuition and bursaries. To me, that represents a commitment to ensure that the NHS is equipped to provide a first-class service in all the future, despite Scotland's changing needs. Let me tell you more of what I really welcome from the Scottish Government. As someone who worked in a psychiatric hospital for the last 20 years, I welcome the focus on mental health and parity of status with physical health. This is the first Government of Scotland to have a mental health minister the first country in the UK to have mental health waiting time targets, and I welcome the extra money coming to mental health to invest in primary care settings. Let me tell you about some of the innovations happening in our constituency of the Highlands and Islands. A couple of weeks ago, I visited the Centre for Health Sciences in Inverness. I met trainee surgeons from all over Scotland who were attending surgical boot camp there, an award-winning training package rich in simulation, which is happening in the Highlands. Of course, the opportunity to conduct research into medical education is making the Highlands a more attractive place to work. And I met a talented young surgeon who's chosen to come and work in Rigmore to take up that opportunity. These innovations pay dividends. Just last week, I visited the University of the Highlands and Islands, where they have a new school of health, social care and life sciences. On offer are nursing courses, allied health professions, and very soon, a graduate entry medical programme. There are challenges in rural recruitment, and they are keen to align and develop their curriculum and research to meet the needs of our region and help drive forward different models of health service delivery. These innovations pay dividends. Let me tell you about some of the changes that are occurring in my own profession of how care is delivered in pharmacy. The move away from the supply of medicines towards sharing our expertise and choosing the right medicine is part of a much bigger picture of developing the multidisciplinary team. So everyone works to their full potential and doctors only do what only doctors can do. The chronic medication service, which encourages joint working between doctors and pharmacists to improve the care of patients with long-term conditions, means that for a serial long, a year-long prescription can be issued and vastly reduce the number of GP visits and enables the pharmacist to both prevent and address medication-related issues. The minor ailments scheme, already very successful for some of our population, could be extended to cover more people and more conditions. And with the extra training currently available in clinical skills and prescribing, pharmacists will be able to do even more to help reduce avoidable harm, to help make patients take, make the best use of their medicines and to free up GP time to focus on the more complex cases. Now let me say, when Ruth Davidson spoke last week about the NHS facing pockets of meltdown, she was talking about the havoc being wreaked on NHS England by her own Conservative government at Westminster. The Scottish service has in fact been bucking the trend south of the border, resisting privatisation, posting a long series of improvements in all the stats that are plummeting fast in England. There will always be pressures on the NHS, but the devolved service under the control of this Scottish Government is coping remarkably well compared to its counterparts in the rest of the UK. Despite the cuts, staffing levels and patient satisfactions are both at record highs. 
That is why when I was working as a pharmacist and I used to attend conferences down south, my medical and pharmacy colleagues would say to me, you're really lucky to work in Scotland. <laughs> I have to say, there is no doubt that there are challenges ahead, but we in Scotland are rising to meet them. Thank you very much. I now call, as winding up, speeches Colin Colin Smith to wind up for Labour. Six minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by declaring an interest as a councillor in Dumfries and Galloway, and also when I was elected in May, I was employed by Parkinson's UK, although that employment has now ceased. This year, we celebrate 68 years of Labour's greatest achievement, our National Health Service. The principle that no matter your class, your race, your age, your financial circumstances, you should be entitled to quality health care free at the point of use is as important today as it was when Nye Bevan spearheaded the establishment of the NHS. However, there is another principle Labour subscribes to. If seven decades on we still want quality health care, we need to properly value our health and social care workforce. As we have heard in today's debate, the reality for health and social care workers in Scotland does not match that principle. There have been plenty of warm words about the workforce in the debate, but what they really want is fair paying conditions and proper staffing levels. Yep. The member will do what Neil Finlay failed to do, and that is to recognise this government is going to pay the living wage to those care workers working with adults from the 1st of October. Would he welcome that? Mr Smith. I absolutely will, and I will come to in detail what I think the government need to do to review the way that policy has been implemented in the course of my speech today, because it is an important policy we support, but the implementation, frankly, has been chaotic. Now, as I said, there have been plenty of warm words about the workforce. What we need is fair pay and conditions and proper staffing levels. Speaker after speaker have rightly highlighted the recruitment and retention crisis facing Scotland. One in four of our GP practices report a vacancy, and we have a ticking time bomb of GPs queuing up to retire. And my own health board in Dumfries and Galloway, the number of GPs has fallen from 134 in 2012 to 118 this year. A quarter of GPs are looking to retire in the next decade, and there are more than a dozen vacancies, including in GP practices facing cuts in hours and possible closures. Across Scotland, the Royal College of General Practitioners predict that by 2020, Scotland will have a GP shortfall of 830, just to bring coverage per head of population back to 2009 levels. And that doesn't take account of the added pressures on GP services. We have an ageing population who need more clinical care than ever before. But it's not just in GP numbers we have a crisis. The picture is no better when it comes to consultants. There are more than 350 vacancies, with nearly half vacant for more than six months. And what about nursing and midwifery posts? Well, there are 2,500 vacancies, including more than 300 mental health nurse vacancies. The Cabinet Secretary said there has been an increase in nursing and mid midwifery staff in post. But that fails to acknowledge this hasn't kept pace with demand. It does not acknowledge that the vacancy rate of 4.2% in June 2016 is an increase from 3.7% over the year, with almost 600 nursing and midwifery posts lying vacant for three months or more. The consequence of high vacancy rates and training posts going unfilled across the health and social care sector is an increase in the burdens on existing medical staff, adding to already unsustainable workloads. The utter failure of proper health and social care workforce management and planning by the government is shown even when it comes to the way the government implements positive, poly posi positive policy initiatives we support. Well, the Cabinet Secretary raised the issue of the living wage, and she rightly said from the 1st of October this year, integrated joint boards are required to ensure the living wage is paid to, ca paid to care workers. Well, that is an aspiration Labour very much supports. I do not need any lectures about the importance of the living wage. I said earlier I was a councillor and I am proud to have played my part in ensuring that Dumfries and Galloway was the first council in Scotland to achieve living wage accreditation. I am also pleased to tell the Cabinet Secretary that all commissioned social care workers will receive the living wage in Dumfries and Galloway from the 1st of October. But I can also tell her the funding provided by the government to meet this commitment was nowhere near adequate enough. With just, with just 10 days to go across Scotland, it's true. I'm happy to share the figures with the Cabinet Secretary that showed quite clearly, because Dumfries and Galloway is a low-wage economy, and that wasn't taken into account in the formula when it came to allocating funding. The cost is actually more than the funding that was provided for that area. 
Now, with just six, 10 days to go across Scotland, councils and providers are scrambling around trying to put in place quick fixes in their procurement policies to meet the deadline. Fixes that may get them through the next year, but are unsustainable and won't guarantee care workers living wage in the long term without a serious rethink by the government. The buck for this rests squarely with the government. This was a policy initiative that was landed on local government at the 11th hour in funding negotiations between the government and COSLA, if you can call the imposition of cuts a negotiations. The first social care providers knew about the policy was when they read about it in the newspapers. No proper cut calculation was made of how much it would cost, with the government's so-called national estimate of £40 million now widely ridiculed, including the unrealistic assumptions made about, about funding. Now, it has been a classic case of the government almost grabbing defeat from the jaws of victory. So I hope the government will review the implementation of the policy by firstly asking local councils exactly how much it will cost to implement the living wage instead of relying on the fantasy figures. Secondly, ensuring they provide a sustainable long-term funding formula that takes account of factors such as rurality. Thirdly, I hope the government not only recognises the importance of the living wage to social care workers, but also training and career progression. And finally, I hope they will show some respect to providers by involving them in those particular talks. Despite this crisis and despite these challenges... No, I'm afraid the you had to stop it finally. finally. And it was a good point. Thank, Thank you very you much. Very much I now move on to Eileen Campbell to wind up the Government Minister. A very tight eight minutes. Eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Conservative motion calls on all parties to work together, and we're always ready and willing to do just that. Uh, but when they are ready to come forward with any ideas or any policy initiatives, we'll, we'll listen. But sadly, that has been lacking from many of their contributions today. But in extending that hand across the chamber, I also want to be robust in articulating the strong record that we have, because that record is both reflective of the challenges we face and demonstrates the progress we have made and actions that we are taking in seeking to address those challenges. Much of the discussion today has been on GPs, and in that context, we should bear in mind that under this administration, no matter how uncomfortable the truth is for the Tories or the Labour front bench, we have the highest number of GPs per head of population in the UK. And indeed, if we had England's GP ratio, we'd have 931 fewer GPs. We have substantially increased the number of new training places for GPs by 100 across Scotland this year. One of a number of initiatives to grow our GP workforce, encourage trainee doctors into general practice and to make a GP more attractive option. We are funding initiatives to encourage established GPs to return to practice and we are continuously looking at how we can support and improve primary care and GP services, a point raised by Gil Patterson, investing £85 million over three years to put in place a long-term sustainable change within primary care that can better meet changing needs and demands, including support for recruitment and retention. I was going to give way to Liz Smith. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Minister, for giving uh, me the opportunity. Um, what is the comment from the Scottish Government about uh, the comments from... Aberdeen University who feel that because of the Scottish Government's capped fee policy that the number of medical students that they can take on is fewer than it might be if that capping policy was not in place. Well, intake to Scottish Minister. medical schools, the Scottish domicile proportion is 48% and we want to make sure that we offer all opportunities to anyone who wants to study in our uh, NHS, in our uh, institutions. It, it should be noted that none of our actions or activities have been driven by government in isolation. This government has always valued the strength of our relationship with those providing the health services that we value so highly. By working alongside the BMA, we have been the first in the UK to abolish the, the bureaucratic quality and outcomes framework, which will support the negotiation of a new GP contract in 2017, a point made well in Mar Marie Todd's excellent contribution. And by working with doctors, we have avoided the confrontation with junior doctors that has dogged the UK government. And we are working with the GPs on the new contract and with our consultant workforce. And moreover, we have seen NHS staff numbers rise to a record high, with more consultants, nurses and midwives delivering care for the people of Scotland. And we are indebted to our dedicated staff, who in the last survey remain committed to their roles and willing to go the extra mile at work. 
But we are determined to continue to attract the, and retain the best talent in the healthcare profession and improve the experience of our staff. And that's why earlier this year, the First Minister announced the £27 million package of support to increase staffing levels throughout the NHS, including training 500 more advanced nurse practitioners and support for nursing and midwifery students experience financial hardship. Briefly. Mr Briggs. Please outline how many GP positions remain unfilled from the previous, um, uh, previous um, recruitment round which took place. Minister. Uh, it's an ongoing uh, process. However, I just want to make sure... I just want to, I just want to make the point, though, to Miles Briggs, though. Um, has he made any representations to the UK government? Because if we were suffering the same level of uh, uh, GP ratio problems that they are in, in England, they would have 931 fewer GPs in England. Um, and of course, we lead the UK in the development of mandatory nursing and midwifery workloads and workforce planning tools that help health boards to plan for the number of staff they require. Now, I said at the start that this government does not shy away from the challenges that we face. The workforce is ageing, recruitment and retention remains an issue, and we need to shift the shape of our NHS so it is responsive to the local needs and delivers more community-based services with a focus on early intervention and prevention, a point made by Ruth Maguire and uh, Brian Whittle. And this requires sophisticated planning and cooperative working and that's why along with our partners we are developing a national health care workforce plan. We already have confidence in workforce planning in our NHS but in line with our manifesto commitments and need to see the pace of change increased we need boards to give more uh, workforce planning a much higher profile and this work must also be cognizant of the new context of integrated joint boards and health and social care integration. Now, many members have made some very useful and constructive comments. For instance, Ruth Maguire and Sandra White described eloquently uh, the societal inequalities faced in Scotland. And to be fair, Brian Whittle, I know they're laughing, but I'm going to point out Brian Whittle, he too talked about the way in which we cope with that. It needs to be rooted in prevention and early intervention. Now, the review of targets and the appointment of the former CMO, who has been an evangelist of empowering people and communities, shifting people from being passive recipients of care to active agents of change in their own lives, is a collective opportunity to shape the future tone of the NHS. Linked to this, Alison Johnson made excellent points on the need to be continually active on the early years. And again, I commend the Early Years Collaborative and the many income maximisation work streams that are happening across that. Again, Alison Johnson made excellent points about doing what we can to support our carers. And that is an area I'm actively pursuing as we implement the Carers Act. Marie Todd spoke with passion and authority about work happening on mental health and the real life impact that national uh, initiatives are having locally, also ensuring that our professionals work at their full potential. Stuart Stevenson also made excellent points, drawing on the post-Brexit burich left by Messrs Cameron, Johnson, Farage and the rest of them, and the impact that that will have on our valued EU dental staff contributing to our communities and our NHS. There were also, however, some comments that were less constructive. Neil Finlay, while I acknowledge he cares about tackling inequalities, fails to recognise progress on areas that I think deep down he agrees with. We know that there is work to do to see the culture change that properly values our social services workforce and that the work they do daily on our behalf to allow others to live in dignity. But to fail to recognise the investment we have put in to enable the payment of living wage for social care workers from the 1st of October is completely disingenuous and that is investment in staff and a positive huge step forward made by this SNP government and one I'm proud of. Alex Cole Hamilton, uh, I want to reassure him that much of what he spoke out about in terms of MSK is being acted on. But like James Dornan, I found the lack of awareness from some of the Tory benches to be absolutely astounding. To, to talk about inequalities and that we should do more in a society when it's been their party that have pursued a harsh and unfair programme of welfare reforms, when it's been them that's brought in the bedroom tax, cut budgets and peddled an unhelpful narrative of skivers and scroungers. They need to have a long, hard look at themselves and really think about the dreadful impact their party has had on families, communities and those and leaving the public services to pick up the tab. Now, 
Presiding officer, my remarks uh, contain details of action activities and investments to tackle the challenges we face, both in responding to the needs of our fantastic and dedicated NHS staff and also responding to the changing societal demands placed on our NHS. We have an NHS that is valued by this government, supported to respond to our country's needs, and we are a government not blind to the challenges, but determined in our effort to tackle them and will work with those that have that same effort to want to do as best as they can for our NHS. Thank you very much. Paul and Miles Riggs to wind up the Conservatives till 5pm, please, or thereabout. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close this afternoon's debate, which has allowed members from across the Chamber to highlight the very real challenges our NHS is facing, as well as giving Stuart Stevenson the opportunity to tell new MSPs about his personal and family medical history. My colleague Donald Cameron set out specific concerns about recruitment of GPs, nurses and consultants, and I'd wish to back up these comments. Alison Johnson, Neil Finlay and Jeremy Balfour have outlined the pressures on GP services, in particularly the severe challenges faced by NHS Lothian in my own region and the region we represent. One third of GP practices across NHS Lothian have stopped accepting new patients. And that figure is around 40% in Edinburgh, with NHS Lothian predicting this is set to become half of all GP surgeries. That is the crisis we're here to debate today. We've had a growing we have a growing population, but quite simply our GP services cannot cope with growing demand. Local residents are increasingly concerned about the situation and the impact it's having on the provision of local services and the time it takes to see a GP here in the capital. Only this morning, my colleague Ruth Davidson and I were presented with a patient's petition of 1,208 signatures, which have been collected locally by our constituent, Mrs. Denise Palmer, to support saving the South Side surgery in Newington. My, I commend Mrs Palmer for her initiative in gathering these signatures from fellow patients and will be sending that petition to NHS Lothian. As Daniel Johnson has outlined, the Southside surgery is now the sixth practice to be taken over by NHS Lothian in recent months after repeated efforts to recruit two new GP partners have failed. And I have to say that to date the Scottish Government's focus on the GP crisis here in Lothian and across Scotland has not been acceptable. The press release announcement we saw in June that the Scottish Government was developing a locum service of pooled retired GPs in Lothian has not exactly given confidence that, to the health professionals and patients across Lothian that the SNP Government is actually working to deliver a long-term sustainable Scottish GP workforce that's fit for the 21st century. We need to support our GP sector, and that's why Scottish Conservatives have proposed a very clear commitment that we should increase NHS funding for GPs to at least 10% of health spending by 2020. This additional resource is critically important, and if we're to attract the GPs we want, given that nearly one in five will be considering retirement in the next decade, we need to re put this funding in place now. As we've heard, the Royal College of GPs has, again, has already warned that Scotland could face a deficit of 830 GPs by 2020. And our hospitals are also experiencing real recruitment difficulties. Just five of the 16 vacancies in emergency medicine were filled. The Scottish Government and the First Minister, as a former Health Secretary, cannot say that we haven't been warning about recruitment, about consultant recruitment, GP and nurse recruitment, as these have been building up on this Government's watch. Scottish Conservatives, alongside the medical representative organisations, have consistently warned about this and demanded more action. In August, the Scottish Government announced the opening of applications for 100 new GP training places in Scotland. However, the fact that the Scottish Government have failed to fill these uh, in the past, along alongside the fact that a quarter of training places in GP surgeries remain unfilled, do not fill the profession with confidence that the workforce planning and workforce needs are being met by this Government. As Alex Cole Hamilton outlined, with only half of medical students studying in Scotland actually being Scottish domicile, the training of our future GPs is clearly an issue this Government has not focused on addressing either. And MSPs welcome... Cabinet Secretary. On that point, I, I take it the member doesn't then recognise the fact that the introduction of a new graduate medical school with a focus on primary care and uh, rural areas, is that not a good thing and would that not be something you might welcome? Even Mr. Mr. Briggs. Well, the Cabinet Secretary isn't actually taking the point that half of students studying here in Scotland are not domicile. They might leave our country. It's something you've not put in place. 
And there's a bigger point here which SNP members on the back benches haven't really understood, that our Scottish NHS doesn't depend on the SNP, it depends on the workforce who deliver day in, day out our health services. We welcome, and I will give... We welcome the fact that the Scottish Government is moving towards GP hubs and a multidisciplinary team. That has the real potential to move patient care in the right way, to deliver the health service when we need it and where we need it. However, this cannot and must not become a, a cover for staff shortages in our health services if it's truly going to reform patient experience and patient access to services and provide the cultural change which will bring all health professionals together. It's also, I believe, important for the Scottish Government to outline what investment plans they have to develop better IT and communication systems, as this will be how we make the future um, patients see the right health professional, and also that the GP hub network is truly going to work when the issue of patient data responsibility needs to be urgently addressed. Presiding officer, since being elected, I've had the pleasure of meeting with many of the professionals who work day in, day out in our health services. I'm sorry to say that the overwhelming message they have given me is that they feel demoralised and in many cases undervalued by this government. One GP I met in Parliament last week told me the service was literally crumbling around him and that the professionals involved feel the Scottish Government ministers simply do not understand the severity of the situation. It's clear for anyone working in our health service that the, surface, the service faces a major workforce planning challenge. When health boards are spending £248 million on temporary agency staff, alarm bells should be ringing in Butte House, a situation which is clearly contributing to the budget pressures of all NHS boards and one that is totally unsustainable. In fact, in the very good briefing which was provided by the Royal College of Nursing in Scotland ahead of today's debate, it states that against the backdrop of funding decisions by health boards based on making savings, increased demand for service and a health reform agenda, there is no single workforce plan supported by clear data to build for the future. There's no plan, Cabinet Secretary. That is what professionals are saying to you. That is a shocking indictment on this government's planning and management of our NHS workforce in Scotland. <laughs> Presiding officer, to conclude, we want our health service to be the best that it can be, the best health service in the world, delivering the best health care for people across Scotland. After nine and a half years in office, it's time SNP ministers took responsibility for the NHS workforce crisis which they are presiding over. Thank you. That concludes the debate on NHS Scotland staffing crisis. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 1571 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme and ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now. No one seems to object. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 1571. So I uh, move the motion on behalf of Bureau, which was... Um, obviously agreed at Bureau this week, um, and hopefully the, the Chamber will support it. Thank you. So what do you do now? I can, I can move on to this. Do you want me to go to this? Yes, you can. Maybe just let you see if you the appeal gets. That will cost the time anyway. Just behind just, you. Just behind you. <laughs> He's behind me, so I can move. <laughs> a little bit. So, can move. Very well. I uh, call the question that motion number 1571 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And the next item, can we move this? Yeah. The next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move on block motion 1570 on office of the clerk. Motion 1572 on designation of lead committees and motion 1573 on the variation of standing orders. Moved on block. Thank you very much. The question on the motions will be put at decision time, to which we will come very soon.
Now, there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business, and I wish to remind members that if the amendment in the name of Shona Robinson is agreed, the amendment in the name of Anna Sawa falls. The question is that Amendment 1554.4 in the name of Shona Robson, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Donald Cameron, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Parliament shall move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 1554.4 in the name of Sean Robson is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 55. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that... Yes, yeah. The next question is that motion 1554 in the name of Donald Cameron as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. Parliament will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 1554 in the name of Donald Cameron as amended is yes, 62, no, 54, there are six abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. I propose to ask a single question on parliamentary bureau motions 1570, 1572 and 1573. Uh, if any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. No one objects. I put the question, therefore, that we agree motions 1570, 1572 and 1573. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll now move on to members' business. Members could... Ministers change their seats.